Buongiorno, benvenuti all'Aquila, benvenuti alla Basilica di Colle Maggio. Dopo il terremoto del 2009, l'Aquila è diventata il più grande cantiere d'Europa ed essendo una città storica, una città ricchissima di patrimonio culturale, è diventata il più grande cantiere di restauro d'Europa. La città è nata nel Medioevo, si è arricchita nei secoli di testimonianze importanti, di spazi a rinascimento, Because there are so many works dating back to the Renaissance, to the Baroque, to the 800s, and therefore we were very committed, starting from the year 2009, in trying to restore all of that, the richness and the importance of the cultural heritage in Aquila is so vast that uh, it is very important for us to rebuild it, to recover it, because that will allow the city to live once again. That is why the Ministry for Cultural Heritage and uh, all other players have been so committed to doing all of that. So we're very happy that L'Aquila and uh, the Basilica of Colle Maggio were included in as uh, one of the sites that you visited during the Restoration Week 2020, because uh, we are sure that with that visit uh, you will learn, and we will learn so many things that may act as a stimulus for us uh, to uh, uh, learn one from the other. So welcome to the Basilica of Colle Maggio. Alessandro. Yesterday we have experienced the first uh, day of the Restoration Week and the first uh, edition broadcasted uh, on uh, a live streaming due to the COVID restrictions. Uh, the period has been very hard for all of us, for our sector, but also for the national and uh, in general for the world economy. The restoration sector uh, has uh, interaction with uh, several areas of uh, of the economy, the construction system, the production industry, the design and survey and diagnostic area, the cultural and creative industry. Santo Stefano in Sessani, where we are now, is an example on how the restoration is mixed with other economical areas. What's the actual situation, Alessandro, and what challenges are we facing? Uh, thank you, Andrea. Good afternoon and uh, welcome back to the second day of the Restoration uh, Week. Uh, the situation is very hard for uh, all uh, and it's different uh, regarding the compartment. Uh, in the Restoration, we use it to difficulties and surprises until the construction phase. Uh, we want to transform this uh, uh, situation from COVID-19 uh, an opportunity to sharing with more people than the other edition. That's why we are in uh, streaming now. And so good luck to all of us. <laughs> Thank you, Alessandro. It's, we get the good luck. We hope so. Franca, uh, we have worked together for solve a lot of difficulties due to the COVID uh, situation. What is the position of the Italian Trade Agency? So, uh, hi, Andrea. So, the COVID situation for us undoubtedly uh, represented an occasion and also a challenge, an even greater challenge, because uh, we were called to try to promote the sector of restoration that we are so proud of. In fact, uh, uh, we believe that it is uh, a testimony, a witness of the excellency that our country is in so many fields. And we are trying to promote uh, uh, restoration through many traditional promotion tools, such as, for example, a trade fair, and also through workshops, uh, and also through other training seminars and other workshops uh, where the tradition and the expertise connected to restoration uh, undoubtedly plays a greater role. So technology, creativity, culture, these are the three pillars upon which we can truly, uh, truly 
build a bridge that connects us to uh, other cu cultures. Now, during this period, due to COVID, of course, uh, we had to develop a, a different type of dialogue that was more focused and also more uh, specific. So we're very happy that this Restoration Week uh, that is uh, being held through the, through the live uh, streaming session was able to involve so many experts, more than 200 experts uh, from uh, uh, about uh, 10 different countries. So, so many people. Yesterday, for example, we had uh, well, the first the, the streaming session with also some sectorial tables, uh, specific tables that were held, uh, specific uh, uh, sessions held with, between experts. So I hope that this, uh, this path that we have started will truly in the future thrive as much as possible in order to express uh, in full its grandeur and may bring about uh, good projects, uh, may promote uh, common objectives and may promote also the culture that we have here in Italy. We have so much to offer our culture, our history. Undoubtedly, we have Michelangelo, we have Leonardo, and we have so many other things. For example, we have so many also uh, uh, activities being also dealt with in the new, with the new Thank generations. You, Frank, also Thank you, Frank. Alessandro. Technology. We'll be back so. from uh, Santo Stefano in Sistano in a few seconds. <laughs> Welcome back to the second edition of uh, the Restoration Week 2020. We are in Santo Stefano in uh, Sessiano, in a little treasure within uh, the mountains of the Appennino Centrale, very close to the city of uh, L'Aquila. As yesterday, we have uh, a delegation invited here. So we are talking to a wide delegation, as Franca Innamorati said, which is uh, uh, connected uh, online, but we are also talking with uh, a very small delegation which is uh, in uh, presence. Uh, before starting, let me uh, mm, stress an important aspect of this Restoration Week. As you can see probably from the surroundings, we have uh, a direction board, we have hosts present here, and uh, to solve uh, the problem uh, of uh, the restriction of the COVID, we have, uh, let me say, invited a new model of communication. And the most important thing is that all the guests invited to participate uh, to the Restoration Week uh, can interact with, our, with us uh, through the chat. Please use it both for technical issues, but also to give us uh, some notes, uh, some information, your opinion. The main issue we are facing is uh, to share our experiences we have, as Frank Innamorati said, we have more than 15 countries connected uh, in, in live streaming, more than 200 invited uh, professional, professionals and experts from all over the world uh, which are present online. So your opinion is very, very important for us. Usually we are we are used to have uh, around 60 guests here in presence. Now we are only six, very selected. Uh, 
but uh, more than 200, as Alessandro said, connected. So please be connected with us. Let me come back to Santo Stefano in Sessanio. Uh, yesterday, we have stressed uh, some words that were important and which are guided all our restoration week. Restituire, to give back something to someone. Uh, and we choose the, the English word as a translation, regeneration. Today, of course, we are talking about restitutione, regeneration, but we have to add another word to our uh, main topic, the abandon. Uh, this very small village, Santo Stefano in Sisanio, in which we are now and which in which we slept tonight and we will sleep the next, uh, have been abandoned for most of the second part of the 1900s. And this abandon is part of the fortune that the place has now. It avoided uh, the post-war reconstruction, the economical boom for the new building, new houses around the city centers, which normally are facing all the villages, all the municipalities in Italy and around. Abandon, it is uh, an opportunity. We started with the solution of COVID as an opportunity to widen and to spread our communication in the world, abandon have been uh, an opportunity for this village to think about of its future. Let's have a look on Santo Stefano. <laughs> Santo Stefano in Sessanio is an idea. Santo Stefano in Sessanio is a vision. Santo Stefano in Sessanio now is a model for the sustainable tourism and uh, the village uh, is experiencing uh, a new life. And this uh, model as a father, and we have with us a visionary man, Daniele Kilgren. So let's continue. I will speak in Italian. So uh, what is uh, fundamental for me is uh, to protect a heritage that was never protected so far in Italy. Uh, uh, architecture as it is not taught in, uh, in university. Uh, perhaps it, it is a poor man's 
type of art, but an approach that I like very much, a type of restoration, restoration that I consider as extreme. For example, what we did here in our town uh, with the, uh, the walls, uh, with these dark uh, uh, shades, for example, we were very extremists in the restoration of this uh, town. Uh, and in some cases, uh, uh, for example, we used uh, some uh, material that we had gathered uh, from other sites, uh, and uh, we tried to also uh, uh, show the, the, the lives of the, of the people who lived uh, in this area in the past. Now, that said, I'm uh, uh, and ignorant in terms of restoration from a technical point of view, but what I'd like to talk about instead is also not only about restoration, but also about economy. Because in 1999, when we came here uh, for the first time, uh, things were so very different from how uh, they are now. Uh, and we needed to uh, protect this area and, and this town, and we discovered that by protecting it, we were also able to uh, reap some money. Now, uh, unfortunately, then, uh, uh, then we had the COVID, uh, but despite that, as a matter of fact, we uh, received many more tourists than we did previously. So what we have to do is to create some services, uh, services that are peculiar in nature, that are not only uh, specifically funneled uh, towards uh, the tourist uh, to attract uh, tourists, uh, but we have to create services which try to protect also the environment and the, the area, uh, 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 an area which uh, sometimes was abandoned in the past. I believe that this marginalization of this town, the, that the town had in the past, uh, can also be exploited as uh, something that may interest the tourists and may somehow entice them to come. Now, we uh, at the moment uh, 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 believe that this should be the heritage of everybody, so we're fighting for that. Uh, uh, in the uh, Colosseum, the Fori Imperiali, for example, uh, were uh, protected in the past, and we have to do the same thing here uh, in uh, the Abruzzi. We cannot uh, 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 violate uh, or somehow endanger these areas uh, in order to promote uh, tourism because uh, that is something, the mistake we should not try to do at all. So thank you very much for your kind attention and I hope to see you again at uh, your next uh, conference. So th thank you, Daniele. You are always on the point. So Santo Stefano in Sessanio is really a model for the for the tourism. We decided to come here because we want to share this model with uh, our partner countries and with uh, with other countries because uh, we can understand uh, more possibilities in reusing uh, places with no high historical meaning or importance. We are not talking about the Colosseum of Rome. It's easy to talk about restoration when we are talking about the Colosseum or the great Egyptian monuments or the great world monuments. We are talking of common houses that, that belongs to the territory and that belongs to the people. So when we are reusing those common buildings, uh, it is uh, a good point to understand that they are part of our history and change them means change in some way the history, the feeling that people are facing. Sometimes uh, avoiding to intervene on a place uh, is a way of saving the place. Yes. The abandon of Santo Stefano in Sessanio have been uh, an occasion for its, tu its uh, future. Sometimes uh, intervene rapidly and efficiently is very important. Santo Stefano Sessanio is in Abruzzo. It is very close to L'Aquila. 
and uh, l'aquila is the symbol of the first recent earthquake in 2009 which have affected not only l'aquila of course but all the surrounding area uh, time is very is a, a very pro problematic issues how to moderate speedness of intervention with the accuracy of the intervention and the conservation of our history and, and building heritage. Time is a challenge. Uh, Notre Dame, after the big fire, after the destruction of the big fire, uh, needs to be reconstructed. reconstructed. The, uh, scientific community is uh, thinking about 10 years as the right period for studying the reconstruction and reconstruct the building. Of course, the French government is aiming at five here. How many times does it take to reconstruct an entire region? Amatri, L'Aquila, 2009, and now 2016, Amatrice, they are very close, two very close regions, but the same area, the same uh, mountains. So L'Aquila have become the symbol of the earthquake in 2009 and the reconstruction, the first reconstruction. This morning we were in uh, uh, Basilica di Colle Maggio with Alessandra Vittorini and we had the opportunity to meet the major of uh, uh, L'Aquila uh, who gave us just a, a greeting, a welcome, but who was uh, in some way underlying the efforts of the local communities to reconstruct their own countries and their own areas. Un caloroso benvenuto alla delegazione di Restoration Week 2020. Benvenuti nella città dell'Aquila, che oggi è un laboratorio internazionale in cui intelligenza, creatività, esperienza tecnica si sono fuse per dare vita al più grosso progetto di ricostruzione non soltanto fisica so ma sociale pro di ricostituzione also, dei legami comunitari che la storia recente non ha mai avuto e un esempio di questo è un esempio also from the point of view of uh, the quality of the Made in Italy approach, you will have the opportunity to visit the uh, Colemaggio Basilica, which is our symbol, the symbol of the tragedy in our city with the uh, debris uh, that are located and were located in the main part of the church. But the church has been uh, now given back to the city of L'Aquila and to the world, having considered that we have thousands of tourists that visit it. And as you see, the window here, the round window, is what we've chosen uh, as a symbol uh, for uh, providing and submitting the uh, uh, city of L'Aquila as a candidate for 2022. And in fact, through culture and through creativity, it is possible to uh, recover the wounds of the city and of the territory, and we are glad to show it to the world. So enjoy your stay in L'Aquila and also in uh, the extraordinary territory surrounding L'Aquila. I'm sure that those that are here today will come back and those that have not been here yet will come soon to visit us. Thank you. Alessandra Vittorini, the superintendent of uh, L'Aquila at the time of the reconstruction of, uh, of, of the area and now the uh, director of the foundation of the School of uh, uh, Cultural Restoration of Cultural Heritage of the Ministry, the Italian Ministry of uh, Culture, is one of the witness of uh, the process for the reconstruction. Uh, of course, uh, uh, a witness uh, in a privileged position to see the effectiveness uh, of the reconstruction works, but also to face the problem 
of uh, the reconstruction. I think that we can say that uh, the earthquake in 2009 have been a very new challenge for uh, for Italy um, for in such uh, a big area and for such uh, destruction in the modern time. Before we were in uh, another era, in a post uh, technological era when we faced the last uh, earthquakes. Now we are facing them with uh, the media on the place every time, with technology which is informing the citizen on what is happening and every one of us uh, seems to have uh, easily an opinion on what is going on. But it's very difficult to judge from an outside position the results of a, a reconstruction. So Alessandra Vittorini this morning we is, we, was with us to show us uh, the reconstruction of uh, the Basilica di Colle Maggio awarded by the Europa Nostra in 2019 and Alessandra Vittorini was with us in the morning to meet the Minister of Culture of uh, Albania. Uh, Alessandra now is telling us something more about the reconstruction and uh, the Colle Maggio Basilica. Good morning. Can you hear me? It's all right. Good morning to everybody. Please let me thank all the organizers and a special President Alessandro Bozzetti for this kind invitation and all the authorities present and Daniele Kilgren hosting this conference. And of course, all the people who is listening and streaming. I also extend a special greeting to the Albanian Minister of Culture, Elva Margheriti, with whom today we found many, we discussed many questions to share in our future, in our future work. Now, I'm going to tell you about the post earthquake reconstruction of L'Aquila that represents an extraordinary experience of management, protection and restoration of cultural heritage, fully supported by public funds. This process was further complicated from 2016 by the subsequent earthquakes, which devastated Amatrice, Norcia and Central Italy, not far from here. The definition of the governance and the legal framework, uh, the challenging tasks a restoring cultural heritage and the planning and technical economic evaluation of interventions are some of the main topics managed in the integrated approach assigned to the L'Aquila superintendents, the first such superintendents in Italy with combined power in monumental, historical, artistic, archaeological and landscape fields. This has given us an extraordinary overview of a complex process due to the importance of the cultural heritage, the severity of the damage and the solutions found. It has also been a very strong opportunity for study, research and scientific discussion on the post earthquake recovery of cultural heritage. As you can see in this slide, the so-called 2009 and 2016 seismic craters are so near and partly overlapped. Their territories have strong geographical, historical, economic and social affinities. And most of their problems are the same. The gray area is the 2009 crater, while the red line defines the southern limit of the 2016 crater. And now, let's have a look back to the 2009. The earthquake shocked a vast area, almost a quarter of the Abruzzo, Abruzzo region, inhabited by more than 140,000 <coughs> 140, people, including a regional capital, L'Aquila, and 56 municipalities with several small historical centers and hamlets. 270 or most. It caused 309 victims and 500 
injured and 70,000 refugees. That territory was dramatically damaged also in its cultural heritage. A big historic center and many small ancient villages with a widespread heritage and ancient traces of a great past since the Roman times. After the first emergency intervention, since 2012, L'Aquila's historic center is a huge hard working. No, please preview a slide, the previous slide still. Okay, thank you. L'Aquila's historic center is a huge hard working, engaging construction site with masons and laborers, trucks and cranes, with cafe, restaurant, restaurant shops, and offices opening, opening day by day while the inhabitants are slowly coming back home. Next slide, please. But we need to know that L'Aquila was an important town since the Middle Age, a new founded city that kept its shape for centuries, a founded city that after 2009 has become a city to be refounded, a city that with its past also contains an extraordinary lesson in urban and civil history, useful for its reconstruction and its future. Indeed, that foundation in 1254 was a response to a widespread need from the communities finding in their aggregation a way to increasing their social and political strength a great project shared by 99 castles, whose result was not only a new town, but also the creation of an extraordinary and unique relationship between each funding castle and its double in town, between the new city and its wide countryside. L'Aquila was then settled where the funding castles identified the most suitable site for the new city, where the future residents would have to build their own homes. Indeed, new inhabitants could move to the city only after having provided for the construction of their square, their church, and their fountain. There are, in fact, the representative and symbolic places of the common assets the civil aggregation, the square, the religious community, the church, and the common resources, the fountain, the water. Today, we used to call it public common works or opere di urbanizzazione, or servizi pubblici. Only a few years later, the inhabitants of the new city commit themselves to the realization of the great common works as the large market square, Piazza Duomo, the Basilica di Colle Maggio, and the big Fontana delle 99 Cannelle. In this way, they built all together the square of everyone, the church of everyone, and the fountain of everyone. Then the new town was enclosed by a five kilometers city walls, still completely preserved. That was an extraordinary lesson of civil engagement of the communities in that shared project on foundation. But by the mid uh, 14th century, the town began to suffer destructive earthquakes. In the following centuries, the historic center was enriched with many important buildings as the monumental San Bernardino church, the mighty Spanish fortress, churches, and palaces. The Antonio Vandis map on the left shows the 18th century city rebuilt after the terrible earthquake on 1703. That reconstruction brought in L'Aquila also a new Baroque image, giving the city the most precious churches and palaces that compose still today its beauty. And so, since almost seven centuries, this continuous process of building and collapsing and rebuilding due to the earthquakes 
is one of the main character of L'Aquila history and of L'Aquila restoration, giving us every day new discovery and surprises. That historic town and the surrounding many ancient villages with their castles, churches, monasteries, palaces, and ancient roots in a stunning landscape represent the cultural heritage devastated by the 2009 earthquake. Almost 942 private owned monuments are protected, largely concentrated in L'Aquila. And also many other public monuments, more than 1,000, are protected by law. The cultural heritage highlighted on this map on the right explains that restricting, uh, reconstructing cultural heritage in L'Aquila means reconstructing L'Aquila. Next slide, please. In that earthquake's history, cultural heritage destruction has been always one of the most problems of reconstruction, a problem that forces us to ensure safety, structural and technological improvement, energy efficiency, urban regeneration, landscape protection, and at the same time, conservation and restoration methodology. In 2016, we brought L'Aquila experience in the ICOMOS international meetings in Paris and Istanbul, especially focused on post-trauma, post-trauma and post-disaster reconstruction. It was the only example of post-earthquake restoration of a wild ancient town. As the debate declared, in all countries affected by natural or human destruction, earthquakes, floods, tsunami, wars and terrorist attacks, in the face of destruction, Many issues need our attention, identity and memory, tradition and innovation, balance between conservation and living heritage. So buildings that may have had little interest to the community can suddenly become extremely symbolic. And that's what's happening now in L'Aquila. Therefore, reconstruction means reconstructing identity and relation with history and memory of local communities, trying to give back to the people that after trauma can develop a fear after of all building and traditional construction methods and therefore required only new ways to rebuild, restore and reinforce building, a new confidence in the ancient technologies and a new strong relationship with its cultural heritage and its memory. Next slide, please. The restoration of the Basilica of Colemaggio has been a symbolic case regarding one of the most important Middle Age monuments in central Italy, and at the same time, one of the most damaged church in the 2009 earthquake. It has been completely restored by the superintendents with the largest privately funded intervention in L'Aquila. After the shock, the basilica completely collapsed in his central area, in the cross between the Aisle and the transept. Eight months later, after the emergency works, was celebrated the Christmas Mass under a provisional coverage. In 2012, Eni, the big Italian energy company, subscribed a sponsorship with L'Aquila municipality to support the basilica reconstruction, involving superintendents, the offices, the office I was uh, I directed for eight years to coordinate the design drawn up with the Roma, Milano, and L'Aquila universities and the construction management. The design was concluded in 2015 and the works started in January 2016. On December 2017, in less than two years, the restoration was completed. The European Heritage Award, Europa Nostra Award 2020, described that restoration as a model of best practice in the conservation of critically damaged sites all over the world. 
at the end of my intervention, uh, I think you will see a short video about this restoration and, and the award. Next slide, please. In 2011, two years after the earthquake, the reconstruction began to involve the old center. Today, there are already many restoration concluded and extensive works in progress. Almost 40 public monuments, 35 in L'Aquila, are restored uh, by the regional secretariat and many other are, going, are ongoing. The superintendents approved restoration project for 320 blocks, including more than 350 private monuments and buildings now started or concluded for most than 90%. As regard the private cultural heritage, most of the old, the old town center, the gra this graphical shows the viewing trend over the last 10 years, 2009, 2019. In terms of numbers, that is the blocks with projects approved, works in progress, or most of them finished, the red line shows the total 320 blocks, including L'Aquila and the Craters villages, the blue line. In terms of costs on the right, that is the value of the public contribution approved. You can see the total amount now corresponding to about 1 billion and 300 millions of euro. 900 millions of euro of public contribution has been calculated, verified and approved only by the superintendents. With my sign at the bottom. Next, next uh, slide, please. So the engagement in the restoration of cultural heritage produced significant results and important economic outcomes. That's an effective indicator of our work and most of all, of its positive effect and impact on the whole reconstruction process, as you can easily check walking in the old town. Just a few weeks after the 2017 opening, the Basilica of Colle Maggio was included in an important tourism website as the main reason to visit L'Aquila in 2018. And in last summer, the tourism in L'Aquila and surrounding area reached a result better than before. And next week, please, ne next uh, slide, please. The achievement of our work have been presented at several scientific meetings in Italy and abroad with the aim of sharing experiences and best practices to make it available to the scientific community and to the decision makers in Italy and in Europe. We promoted many activities in information and communication about cultural heritage reconstruction, involving the other players and the communities, participating to every public conference to present results and works in progress, and to ensure accountability, organizing public events in the restored places, sharing everything about our experience, so good and bad question. In the 2018 European Year of Cultural Heritage was launched the European Quality Principles for a, a European Union funded intervention on cultural heritage. In this picture, in the center, you can see the presentation in Venice. Please note behind the speakers Cole Maggio on the screen. Yes, because they opened their meeting just talking about L'Aquila and the Basilica restoration. On the left, you can read a short summary of the document. And after the big fire of Notre Dame de Paris, sharing knowledges and capacities on cultural protection has become an urgent need, as clearly declared by the president Macron. You can, you can read on the, on the right uh, an, an important declaration by President Macron on, on, uh, on the Journal du Dimanche. And so, 
every experience in post earthquake reconstruction can be strategic. And today, 10 years after, many topics ask us questions about cultural heritage reconstruction, safety versus conservation, restoration versus reconstruction, improvement versus structural upgrading, protection, protection versus innovation, public interest versus or individual rights, and finally, old villages or new suburbs. Our wonderful work always proposes difficult problems to solve, facing different challenges in order to ensure safety and good reconstruction, social reporting, and accountability of public funds. Therefore, we are altogether responsible for giving back to every city its people and returning at the same time to each community its identity also represented by the places of its history and its memory. It's a process that will need its time, but must focus on rebuilding not only homes and cities, but also the connection between stones, buildings, spaces, and relationship. So give back the city life in the city center is now the most important and the most difficult mission to conclude the reconstruction, giving back to the communities the keys of their cities and of their lives, and at the same time, giving back each community to its identity and its history, back to its memory, and finally, back to its future. Finally, a picture and some words that I like so much stolen to a poet, a singer of our generation. The first church restored and reopened in the old town in 2012, with its frescoes emerging from the wall, tells its ancient and suggestive history, today rediscovered, as it happens in every restoration since 10 years. And these few words, there is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in, are, in my opinion, the best definition of resilience. Thanks for your attention. The video of uh, the restoration of Basilica di Colle Maggio, as you saw in the slides, have ended uh, with uh, the Europa Nostra Award. Europa Nostra has a great opportunity, again the same word, uh, the opportunity to observe from above uh, several national examples and approaches to the restoration and read and compare those uh, examples with specialized uh, officials and directors. Uh, Lorena, um, Aldana Ortega, European Policy Coordinator of uh, Europa Nostra, will start from Colle Maggio, but will end somewhere else. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, can you hear me? So, on behalf of Europa Nostra, I would like to start by thanking the organizers of the Restoration Week, uh, the colleagues who are here present physically, and those of you who are uh, connected at home. Um, let me start by saying a couple of, I have a PowerPoint presentation, uh, by, by saying a couple of words about Europa Nostra, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with our work. Europa Nostra is the largest, the most representative, and the leading um, pan-European pan -European federation of heritage NGOs uh, dedicated to the protection and to the promotion of cultural heritage. We have been active for over 60 years, and uh, we have presence in more uh, than 
for the countries in uh, Europe and beyond. So our mission is to protect and promote Europe's cultural heritage, and we do this uh, through uh, different actions. So notably, first, we are mobilizing for endangered cultural heritage through our uh, scheme called the Seven Most Endangered in cooperation with the European Investment Bank. We are also promoting excellence and rewarding good practices in the heritage field through our uh, European Heritage Awards, Europa Nostra Awards, which you have already heard about uh, today and which was granted to Colemaggio uh, last year. And uh, third, we are also advocating towards policymakers, um, mainly at European Union level, uh, highlighting the benefits of cultural heritage uh, for uh, for Europe and making sure that cultural heritage uh, is high in the agenda of the EU. So uh, with these three uh, interlinked field of actions, our aim is to protect our past, to craft uh, new visions for the present and to build for our future. So this is why I have entitled my presentation today, Cultural Heritage Counts for Europe, Preserving Our Past, Building Our Future. Um, very briefly, just the structure of my presentation today, I will start uh, by tackling the topic of this conference, so the reuse of heritage buildings uh, and its socioeconomic impacts for uh, local development, but placing this on a European level and notably in a context of the current uh, crisis that uh, uh, Europe is facing. Um, then I would give you two examples or two good practices uh, from our European Heritage Awards, Europa Nostra Award Scheme. The first one in uh, Amsterdam, Center for Media, Fashion, Culture and Craft. Um, and the second one in South Valley of Añana in the Basque Country in Spain. And then I will try to wrap up and uh, extract some key learnings uh, from these case studies that we can use uh, for uh, the future of Europe in the aftermath of the pandemic. Um, so what you see in the screen is actually a graph uh, from a now landmark study that we have produced in uh, 2015 entitled Cultural Heritage Counts for Europe, which was uh, co-authored and led by Europa Nostra with other European partners and um, financed by the European Union. So this, uh, this study presents a compelling evidence of the multiple benefits um, of cultural heritage for Europe. So I don't know if you're still able to see the graph, but I'm going to describe it to you anyway. Voila. Um, so these are the different impacts that the reuse of heritage building can have for local communities and for Europe as a whole. Of course, uh, in pink, you see the most obvious one, which is cultural impact. So the uh, saving and uh, preserving uh, aesthetic, historic, uh, symbolic value, commemorative value, uh, promoting creativity and participation in cultural life and so on. Then you have in uh, green the social impact, so creating social capital, uh, fostering uh, a social cohesion, a sense of place, a sense of belonging. Then you have the uh, environmental impacts, which is particularly, uh, of course, relevant for the case of reuse of heritage buildings, which uh, links to the circular economy, to the green economy, uh, the reduction of the urban sprawl, uh, sprawl by uh, reusing heritage buildings and uh, reducing the uh, environmental impact of building and uh, demolishing uh, buildings. And finally, economic one, of course, creation of, uh, of highly skilled uh, rewarding jobs, tourism, cultural tourism, um, and the attract attractiveness of cities and places and different spillovers. So we see these four uh, pillars approach as really the um, multifacetic uh, impact of cultural heritage leading to sustainable development. So what is this? why is this important and why it is so valid uh, in the particular context that we are living in? At Europa Nostra, we are working uh, to convince the European Union policymakers that in the aftermath of the pandemic, cultural heritage and the use of heritage buildings because of all these impacts can be really a catalyst for the recovery uh, of Europe. So how do we do this? We do this, of course, through advocacy work, uh, through lobbying uh, directly to policymakers, but we are also using the power of example. So we are uh, 
identifying, promoting, and rewarding good practices through our uh, Heritage Award scheme that you see in the screen. We have been running this scheme since 2002 uh, with the European uh, Commission, so it's co-founded by the European Union. Uh, and uh, it happens yearly, so I also take the opportunity to encourage you to apply the applications uh, submissions are open until the 1st of October. So uh, this is really the most prestigious, uh, the top award in the heritage field in Europe. So let me just give you a couple of examples. Uh, I won't go into the technical details. I would like to focus more on the uh, social uh, economic impact of these cases. So the first one, which you see in the screen is the Hulls Amsterdam Center for Media, Fashion, Culture and Craft. Uh, which was a laureate um, for conservation category in 2015. And we have a short video so that you can see the, this, the whole Amsterdam uh, is a traditional functionalist uh, building uh, that was a, a complex that was built for um, the maintenance of the first electrical trams in Amsterdam uh, in 1901. So, of course, ever since it was used for the trams, first for maintenance, then as a workshop, and uh, then it was abandoned and left in decay. So what is interesting uh, in, this, in this building, what is, let's say, characteristic, it's its uh, monumental facades. You can see it in, in the screen with a close, um, a large bricks, and it's located in the heart of a neighborhood that was uh, an enclave in Amsterdam during the expansion of Amsterdam in the 19th century. Uh, so just very briefly, a timeline so that you can see the, the milestones. Uh, the, the oldest structure was uh, built in 1901. Then uh, it was expanded and modernized according to the tram and the different technologies that uh, this um, medium of transport required. And uh, almost for a whole decade served this purpose. But then uh, an, a larger and uh, more modern uh, tram depot was constructed. And in 96, the public transport company left the area and the decay uh, started. In 2010, it was squatted. Uh, and this contributed to the deterioration of the building. So in that same year, in 2010, um, uh, local residents, uh, stakeholders, architects, uh, heritage professionals, and basically the neighbors, got together and um, founded a non-for-profit, uh, which is called the Trom uh, Depot uh, Renovation Project. And they started the renovation of the building in 2013. So now in 2020, it is a vibrant cultural uh, center. It holds uh, a, a cinema, it holds a TV studio, gallery, uh, a library, hotels, also restaurants and other social functions such as nursery uh, and so on. So um, I just want you, I, I, I have written the, what the jury of the awards thought that it was really exceptional about this, uh, this uh, reuse project. So basically you can see that the conservation was made in a way that is the history is still being respected, but it's, of course, uh, adapted to new uh, standards, highest uh, living standards, and also the determination of the local people to save this building. It was actually uh, the social component of this project is very important. It was the, the people, the, the neighbors who in uh, 1999 uh, uh, won the fight to make this building an, a national monument. So there's a very strong ownership. So future uh, users and the residents were involved from the very beginning, a very strong, uh, let's say, civil uh, engagement component. Then the contemporary re uh, use responding to the new needs of the community in this uh, context, uh, the cultural life, and the social ambition. So not only a financial uh, or economic project. Uh, some results, uh, the preservation, of course, of the integrity of this uh, heritage site, uh, because the, also the reuse was made uh, with uh, mainly reversible and flexible construction. Then the dynamic mix of, of users that are involved, so there are uh, really different segments of the population that are using it and enjoying it. It's uh, financially feasible with a mix of commercial and social functions, so actually 
40% of the budget comes from private investors. And there was also a scheme uh, for tax, tax deduction on the restoration. So this allows that many social actors, for example, the library, uh, come there uh, and the costs are paid by the commercial functions, for example, the stores. Um, and finally, yes, uh, it significantly attracted uh, more visitors and uh, residents alike, not only to the place itself, but also for the whole district uh, in Amsterdam. Um, second example that I would like to very briefly, um, I look just if I am too long, um, the second example that I would like to present, it's quite a different one, but also uh, very meaningful, I find. It's the South Valley of Añana in uh, País Vasco in northern Spain, also winner of 2015 conservation category. So I will play again just a short video so that I can describe the site while you, while you watch. Uh, so this uh, South Valley of Añana, it's a, a, a valley of the 13 hectares. Uh, whose uh, original function was salt production from a salt spring uh, that has been in use for the past 6,500 uh, years. So um, the, the particularities of this architecture, as you can see in the video, is um, that the evaporation terraces that are built with a dry stone, woods, and clay, and which were built by the salt workers it, uh, themselves. So they were uh, developing over the centuries this know-how also based in a uh, trial and error and improving it uh, with the years. So um, yeah, during the, the 20th century when the the mass production of the salt started and it was uh, quantity was more important than quality the um the valle salado went into decay and stopped uh, really uh, its use and it was really deteriorated so it was in, two th in 2000 that the salt workers and in cooperation with local authorities and other stakeholders decided to uh, develop the master plan for the recovery of the valley similarly to the last case that i presented also they founded a governance structure that took care of uh, the planning and the development. So the creation of the Valle Salado Foundation, gathering all relevant stakeholders, including uh, private owners of, of the salt um, um, production, the salt workers, national, local and regional authorities, and so on. The project started develop in 2011 with the aim of recovering 50% of the total area that was dedicated to produce salt, but also including new uses, cultural, social, and related to tourism, that could help uh, developing the site while, of course, preserving its authenticity. So, um, yeah, in 2013, the cultural landscape was declared as a qualified monument site. In 2015, was awarded by Europa Nostra uh, Award. And today, it's a powerful driving force for local development in the area. Um, the jury of Europa Nostra really commended the fact that this project is not only a rest restoration project, but it's also affecting positively impacting the economic life of the inhabitants and recovering the industry of the salt, which uh, was uh, present since very remote times. So uh, three, let's say, positive aspects of this uh, recovery plan was that it was based on ancient know-how um, that was locally developed. The holistic approach to development it's not only uh, in industrial or uh, heritage approach, but also cultural, economic, social, and the resilience of the site with the ability to absorb the negative impacts and uh, introduce innovations throughout its uh, history. So, um, some results: the recovery and uh, preservation of the of the site. Now they are producing a top quality international recognized salt, which is actually a, a product of a slow food. Now that we are uh, in Italy, a uh, slow food bastion, an international product. Um, it's a highly profitable investment. So basically 30% of the budget is coming from the salt uh, sale and from guided uh, visits. 
and it has had a spillover effects for the local community, but also for the surrounding district. So it has became a, become a benchmark regarding the recovery of heritage and the development of cultural, social, and economic and tourism activities. So uh, just wrapping up here, why, why is this important and how can we take these local experiences to the European level. So basically uh, what we are doing at Europa Nostra and what we think is of, uh, of uh, importance, of a key importance now that the European Union is uh, rebuilding and uh, defining policies to recover our society and economy in the aftermath of the pandemic is that we actually need to create a narrative. We need to create a narrative uh, and convince policymakers and convince the institutions that are uh, developing these policies that cultural heritage actually provides a solution and that cultural heritage reuse uh, and uh, preservation can contribute to Europe's uh, presses, pressing challenges. So uh, the heritage sector must once again prove the value, uh, the social value of, of, of what we do. And we need to develop socially and economically uh, useful projects with tangible results that can actually provide uh, concrete ev evidence on this um, contribution. So how can we make a difference? Uh, we are working to urge leaders to mobilize the transformational power of cultural heritage to uh, contribute to the recovery of Europe and to build a greener and inclusive and more uh, resilient society. So, uh, yeah, that's it from my side. I would like to thank you for your attention. Hope I was not too long. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lorena. Thank you very much, uh, Alessandra Vittorini. Uh, this is the, the end of the first part of, uh, of uh, this day. Europa Nostra gave us the opportunity to introduce us and projected us uh, in uh, an international environment context. Um, the Restoration Week uh, is uh, dedicated mainly to the Italian companies, but is... Uh, uh, directed to the international uh, context. Uh, since 2006, with the Italian Trade Agency, we are experiencing this cooperation with uh, international partners uh, and uh, professionals. This time, uh, also during this restriction period, restricted period, we get the opportunity of uh, talking and interacting with uh, an international uh, delegation. Uh, and we have asked our guests to narrate their, their experiences uh, correlated to the work we are doing and we are talking about uh, in it, together with the international organization present here during the Restoration Week and connected uh, online, we have uh, the pleasure to host uh, some countries, uh, partner countries for the future development of uh, the Restoration Made in Italy project. Albania, Egypt, Tajikistan in some way are present here with us today and they are bringing their own experience first of all not only in uh, alphabetic order i have the pleasure to introduce uh, albania we have the honor to have with us today the minister elva margariti minister of culture of uh, albania today she is here with us for the restoration week tomorrow she will be in Rome for a bilateral meeting with the Minister of Culture of Italy, uh, Franceschini. The first uh, after the earthquake in Albania and the first uh, after the COVID uh, uh, emergency. I want to thank you first uh, for being here at the Restoration Week, but I have to thank you on behalf, I think, of our, of Italy because uh, of uh, the help 
of your government during uh, the COVID uh, period. Uh, you send us uh, doctors uh, and equipments for helping our healthy system. We hope to be able to uh, give back some experience and some professionals in the field of reconstruction after the earthquake. Minister, please. My pleasure to be here today and thank you for the invitation and also thank you for all this long week of sharing energies together and as you said I'm quite sure that this will be a further step of collaboration between Albania and Italy since we are a bigger family as I said also today to Alessandra. We have so much in common and unfortunately uh, here in this uh, city, we share also a post-earthquake intervention. And uh, I want to share those experiences as a Minister of Culture, but also as a simple citizen of uh, Albania. I'm double honored to make it uh, here today in Italy, because um, this country of eternal beauty has given so much to me since uh, Yet it has been a long path. I've been living in Italy for 16 years, so I'm grateful double to this country. And I'm quite sure, as I said, this will be a first strong step that we will discuss also tomorrow with uh, Minister Franceschini for further collaboration on know-how on uh, restoration. I would uh, like to thank you all the participants for sharing their energies and uh, all their presentations and i would apologize uh, also to switch into italian just for a sign of respect to the hosted country and as i said that's also a sign of love to my 16 years here in italy so um come vi ho detto non as i said I am speaking not just in my capacity as Minister of Culture, but as an Albanian citizen when last year on the 21st of September, well, it was a quiet uh, Saturday afternoon when an earthquake occurred. And on that occasion, uh, the earthquake certainly uh, didn't uh, take human lives away, but it didn't save, unfortunately, uh, cultural heritage and monuments. And uh, in our first visit in our National Museum, in a case, we saw one cross dating back to 1748, which had fallen down. Maybe, well, today we may think that it was a sort of uh, premonition of the earthquake we had two months later. And the earthquake caused uh, a lot of uh, casualties and 17,000 displaced people, nearly 100 schools that mm, were destroyed during a terrible night. And we woke up in the morning, uh, all the, the same, we were all parents, and we were all sons, we were all fellows, and we all needed to survive. Then, as a government, on that day, we had to adopt a number of measures, urgent measures, and we had to be practical. And we also had to provide some answers, the right answers to the people asking for solutions in that moment. So, during the long mornings, uh, in which we held uh, our government meetings, we were asking questions to ourselves. That is to say, shall we, um, for instance, act immediately? Shall we uh, recover the small injuries and wounds? Or should we stop and plan the future of the country? 
we could do some small steps first to be on the safe side, whereas we chose, and also with the support of the neighboring countries and the support of Italy in particular, we decided to stop and think, and also to learn from your experiences uh, when it comes to earthquakes, but also to learn from your errors sometimes. So for this reason, we have established a broad network of uh, stakeholders that helped us and actors, including uh, architects, psychologists, uh, social services. So the team was so huge that we had a national committee for reconstruction, including over 50 people. And in less than 40 days, we have set up detailed development plans for the uh, areas uh, struck by the earthquake, involving not only the needs of houses, but also new areas, new districts that will be uh, uh, the districts that shall not be considered as, for instance, the uh, earthquakes of uh, the uh, districts of the earthquake, but rather districts including uh, uh, kindergartens and uh, nursery schools and uh, healthcare services and squares and areas for children, but also with a memorial uh, for the victims of the earthquake. So, the work was carried out uh, very quickly, and uh, in Albania we already have 33 uh, building sites operating in the areas affected by the earthquake, and we uh, finalized the designs relating to schools, 150 schools, and our promise is that children will have to see their new school by the end of this year. We have already given uh, the houses back to the displaced people of the earthquake of September, and we promised to fix and uh, recover uh, the houses of those that were the victims and which had to leave their houses uh, in uh, November. The uh, COVID pandemic uh, has slowed down a little bit our activities, but we are keeping our promises and we are doing so also in the cultural heritage framework because everything is part of a big puzzle involving uh, upgrading, restoration. And uh, today we're here in one of the best examples uh, that we've mentioned on several occasions in my country when we talked about, for instance, uh, uh, the uh, uh, rural recovery of the 100 villages. So there is a program that we have deployed in our country. And these are the measures and the actions uh, uh, that we cannot do alone. And you know this much better than I do. So a special thank goes to all of our partners that are helping us, to the European Commission, with which we are now developing a package of uh, measures involving over 40 buildings that go beyond uh, restoration because we want to give a new momentum to all of these buildings. This is something we did in over 13 city centers in uh, cities and hamlets and we will share our experiences and uh, also with two main examples, uh, that is to say to uh, centers uh, with a lot of young people and with whom we are developing new uh, projects like the Center of Valona, where we have recently uh, unveiled the uh, Jewish Museum uh, in uh, Albania, and we will go ahead with new challenges. One of these challenges is that we set up the National Fund for Cultural Heritage, that is to say, uh, 
this is a sort of treasury for culture. And I hope, as I said with Alessandra, I hope we can, uh, for instance, launch our training activities soon. These are uh, our ideas, and uh, my um, colleague will show you some examples. I'd like to thank you for inviting me, and I thank you for all the things you are doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. We have highly appreciated uh, your participation to the Restoration Week, but we have certainly appreciated your speech as a citizen. The commotion was clear in your voice, uh, as the commotion was clear in our face yesterday during the visit uh, at the red zone of Amatrice after four years uh, of the earthquake. We are not talking only about restoration we are not talking about only buildings but we are talking about souls and life and other two example as the minister introduced from uh, albania uh, irona androni advisor of the minister of culture thank you so i'll be introducing today uh, two good examples that uh, uh, will represent here our restoration process and on these historical sites. I hope on our next uh, visit or our next week of restoration, we will be able to show you the restoration of the monuments that is undergoing um, right now in Albania now due to the earthquake. So, uh, we will start with um, two of the most important cities that we have, Vlora and Korcha. The first one I will present is, is Korcha, which is uh, the bazaar. Um, this old bazaar, it's actually, it has like a very uh, high importance, not just into the city, but it's one of the most important bazaars of Albania. It, it started uh, like being vivid since the 15th century, but actually right now it has more like the form it used to have by the late 19th century. So, like the urbanic, uh, the urbanistic concept of this bazaar is with combined squares and this long intersection of streets, and used to be a very vivid place. And uh, on the last years, it was completely forgotten. So, we want to present here a little bit more of what it was and how it's now today. So, the main interventions that were um, part of this Korta uh, Old Bazaar. Uh, are the um, structure consolidation works. We did a lot of uh, renovation of wooden structures. As you can see here, the facades are actually really um, in a bad shape. So there was a lot of work going into reinforcement of these monuments and uh, also uh, turning them into, into hubs for um, new culture life and also for new services. I want to... Um, I want to say that this actually, uh, like the old bazaar, uh, has a protection. So uh, most of the buildings are the second degree. And we also have uh, like five monuments that are also like the first degree. So this is a picture of what it looks now. So we have in total about 150 objects restored. And this translates a little bit into, into 15,000 square meter of historical buildings. And this layouts into 9,000 square meter of plaza and pedestrian connection upgraded. So these are a bit uh, some of the figures that will introduce um, what impact this um, intervention has had. So Korta was actually turned into this um, TID. So it turned out to be um, one uh, is a scheme where uh, all the the services that are there, um, they collaborate with the municipality, so the taxes go back to the bazaar. So they do not go to the local government, but it's like a kind of a loop. So every money spent in the businesses or the taxes they spend, uh, it's turned back uh, into the bazaar. So we have about 7.5 million of your of dollars spent on this infrastructure. There are about um, 60% of increased uh, property value. Uh, we have new businesses opened, like 84 of them, uh, 232 uh, new jobs generated, and uh, the, num the number of visitors is like three times more, it's like 343%. And actually right now, Korcha has been turning to be one of the 
uh, of the cities where a lot of activities are being introduced. We have like a total of 73 uh, different programs and different and different fees coming there. So it has been turned into one of the must-see landmarks of the city. Uh, this is one of the hotels that is part of the um, of the bazaar, and we wanted to introduce it here as a good example. It's um, it's called Hani Pazarit, which is basically the inn of um, of the bazaar. It's turned into this boutique hotel with these restored rooms and very nice interiors. So um, we hope that many more will flourish into the area. And the next example, which is a little bit more um, specific it has to be it has uh, to do with a historic center of uh, Vlora. we have here um, this uh, neighborhood which was left neglected during uh, a couple of during like for a long time so um, like taking into consideration this whole zone which had about which has about 13 monuments in overall and there has a lot of buildings which have um, for example, values on their facades, etc. So uh, it was time uh, to go to Vlora, but not as a coastal city, as it's known uh, broadly in Albania, but now to go back there as a historical one. So if you if you go now there, you can find that uh, what used to be is undergone, like uh, it has a new face. So here I want to show some of the pictures, the before and after. Uh, right now, the, most of the restoration is done, and now the businesses are starting to open. So the municipality is now being helped with other um, institutions. And I, wants, I would also like to say that the AEDF, which is this organization in Albania, has helped with the funding uh, in these both projects. So right now we have like 51 historic buildings restored and there were a lot of informal buildings there as well. 50, uh, 15 of them are upgraded. Some of them are of course demolished, the ones that were occupying the public space. And in total we have like 20,000 square meter of plazas and pedestrian which were added to the city and to the tourists that come and visit it. Uh, we have less figures for Flora as it is a new open site. So it will be I think upgraded uh, during the time, but still we can see even on this summer, uh, which was a difficult one also, uh, we had like this property, this increase in property value about 30% and uh, there were like 130 uh, businesses impacted and the number of visitors uh, is like 70% more. So people do not just go there now for the coast and the beach, but to also go to uh, spend time in the city and learn more about it. And um, I just wanted to uh, show you some of the pictures and some of the businesses that are there. Um, the second picture is shown about this retro um, event. So these old cars just passing through the city. Um, and it's now turning to be into a very vivid place. So uh, that will be it for the two presentations. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ilona. Uh, we are we are staying in the international context. E Egypt is uh, uh, almost a bordering country. We are all Mediterranean countries. We Egypt is uh, a target country for our promotional system and for the agency for the cooperation to the development. Uh, the new system, the new project for Restaurant Restauro Made in Italy is uh, looking at Egypt uh, as an opportunity for new challenges. Uh, Egypt has a huge cultural heritage uh, asset, both archaeological, but even uh, the new, let's say, the modern construction in uh, the Cairo area. But what we want to stress when we are talking about restoration that we are not only talking about the big monuments. We want to talk about uh, our environment, built environment, our city centers, our modern architecture as a part of our culture and identity. So, uh, Heidi will 
talk about uh, it is uh, an official for the urban harmony organization of Cairo in Egypt will give us three examples of uh, uh, restoration and regeneration adaptive reuse in Egypt thank you very much Thank you so much, Mr. Alessandro, and uh, I would like to thank um, all the organizers uh, who are uh, belong with this uh, week to uh, give us a chance to be with you here. And uh, actually, I'm here to present the National Organization for the Urban Harmony, and we are uh, belonging to the Ministry of Culture uh, from Egypt. Uh, can we show the slide, please? Yes. Uh, first of all, this is uh, our organization. Uh, um, uh, buildings that um, has been built from the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. And also um, we have in Egypt two uh, main uh, ministries working with uh, uh, heritage preservation. Uh, the first one is the Ministry of Antiquities and it's working to uh, listing the old monument uh, buildings and they uh, make a regulation for the surrounding very uh, narrow surrounding area around the uh, monuments and um, the ministry of uh, culture uh, from the national organization for urban harmony uh, that we are uh, dealing with the new heritage buildings and and we are making the listing and regulations for the uh, listed heritage area. And we have uh, many few uh, listed areas inside Cairo and also uh, in the Alexandria and uh, Borfoed near to Borsaid. So one of uh, our uh, big uh, projects that we are working with uh, nowadays is the revitalization of the downtown Cairo. And it has been uh, built uh, from uh, in the middle of the 19th century and bega the beginning of the uh, 19th century from uh, 1880 uh, by the Khedivik uh, Ismail. And uh, the, the planning, uh, the planner, oops, I'm sorry. The planner of this, uh, the planner of uh, of this area uh, was uh, Hausmann, the French planner who is making uh, Paris too. Uh, so uh, it has the same characteristic in the urban uh, planning uh, area. And uh, in this area, we have uh, more than uh, 750 listed building, like a, a valuable heritage building, not an antiquities uh, building. Next, please. So in this area, we are uh, working now uh, for the uh, modern heritage building and make restoration for all the facades that we have. Uh, one of them, uh, one uh, of uh, of them, uh, pu very beautiful building. Thank you so much. Is the Khedivik, uh, Khedivik, uh buildings, and there are four complex, similar complex for the Italian uh, architect Antonio Lasciac. And we are uh, did the restoration for all the facades for these buildings and uh, to make uh, renovate it. And uh, some proposals of this building has been uh, put it for a uh, reuse this building, not only restore it and leave it uh, empty or without uh, or without uh, reuse a uh, new function. And also we have in the downtown of Cairo, we have many corridors like Behelar corridor. We uh, make uh, some restoration for these uh, corridors uh, also be, uh, because it's connecting uh, the district. And uh, this is the before of the Imedidine Street for example and after it being looking like that when we make the restoration for these facades we we seeing all the beauty uh yani behind the time that's come uh, on these uh, facades and make uh, the detailed restoration for all the um uh, for all the uh, um, antiques uh, antiquity and the old uh, rest um, old decoration in the facades and when we found something missing in the uh, in the in the facade around a decoration around the uh, entrance or around the windows or something like that, we can uh, regenerate uh, this uh, decoration and put it back, like this around the facades and the, all the um, iron work around the uh, balconies. And also we have uh, many, uh, we are working on, uh, on, uh, also on the social aspects 
in the downtown of Cairo, and we are uh, working to encourage the people to spend more time in the downtown Cairo now. So we have Al, Al, Al Alfi Street, and uh, it was a bit street. It was a car uh, uh, street actually, and then it, it began to a uh, pedestrian uh, street. So we renovate all all of this street, and we um, make revitalization of the uh, of the activities that's ha happened in this street to make it uh, like a restaurant and coffee shop. Uh, we have a lot of work here in the level and also in the urban level to encourage the people to come to stay in this area. This is a before and this is after. And also in this uh, in this street, uh, especially uh, the owners of the of the coffee shops and the restaurant make a union together to uh, manage uh, to, to maintain uh, to make the maintenance and the management for uh, this area to uh, keep it uh, clean and safe. And also one of the other pedestrian is the El Shrifin uh, uh, Street, and uh, we uh, designed this street to be the culture hub in the downtown Cairo. Street and we make the uh, uh, the um, uh, the heritage uh, the festival of the uh, new Her the heritage day and the 14th the world heritage day and the 14th and the 18th of April and we uh, invite uh, some musicians and some uh, people to make a drawing or a sculpture or something like that in the street and we make a um, monthly agenda for these uh, activities and we announce this, uh, I will announce it in the uh, Ministry of Culture. Uh, one of the uh, rebuilt, uh, one of the uh, experiences that we have, valuable experience that we have in the downtown Cairo, that's the living was. And living was uh, was um, being built. It's a valuable building. Uh, it uh, was built from the uh, 1996, and it has been restored by a Smalia company. So um, for real estate, and they uh, did a lot of work in this building. And uh, this is an example to the reuse of the building because they, after they renovate this building, they uh, make it like um, uh, the uh, uh, administrative hub for an international. Uh, company, so this is very good to be uh, relocated. These activities in downtown Cairo again, and this is a building before the restoration. And they did this example very, very good uh, example from the outside building and also from the uh, inside for all the co corridors or and all the maintenance and to um, uh, to the cracks and everything. And also the ceiling, and they are uh, putting all the uh, stuff that, uh, that uh, was missing in in these uh, buildings. And this is after and before for the entrance and the ceiling of the uh, building. This me uh, this uh, building has uh, four thousand square meter, and it's now uh, using like an office uh, space for an international uh, for an, an international company. Another uh, example, we will go to the uh, Estrian Desert. In the heart of the desert, we have oases, Siwa oases. And this is one of the examples to reuse uh, small houses, traditional, very old houses, like um, an hotel, like here, like we uh, found here in San Stefano, um, Alexandria, and Sixtenio, uh, sorry. And uh, this is uh, what we have in Siwa uh, oases. We have Mount, and we have uh, a very big, uh, and we have a very big surrounding area that's uh, named Chali, and it has been built uh, before from many, uh, uh, from more than hundreds of years, and uh, we have uh, these uh, all the opportunities to uh, encourage the uh, ecological tourism here. So. This example, and we we also have uh, temples from the Pharaonic period, Amun Temple. It's from the Pharaonic period also. So this is the old chalet, and it has been destroyed because uh, a lot of people didn't live uh, there uh, now because they leave the, the, the old building and going to uh, build a new building and uh, a very big building, residential building uh, surrounding. So this is the, the place of the, um, of the hotel. Its name's uh, Babin Shell. So the Pabin Shell was uh, like this. Uh, it was many uh, houses, and they open it together and union it together and reuse it after the, the, making the renovation. This is the was the 
space for the building. All these buildings has been built by the Karshif. The Karshif is a, a, a material, a natural material. Um, they built it from the stones that they found in, uh, around the uh, lake, the salt lake. Uh, surrounding a siwa and they uh, make a plaster from the mixture with mud and salt and some uh, addition. It's all by natural natural addition. They make it like that. Uh, the project has been done with uh, by EQI, one of uh, our uh, specialist uh, company for the rehabilitation of these kind of, of buildings. And this is a few from the night. They are looking to the remains of the uh, Chali uh, culture. And this is, um, and also what's the, what the good uh, in this experience that they are uh, encourage the local community to work with them in the restoration and rebuild, and they use them uh, to uh, work with them in the hospitality of the hotel also. And they cover the roofs by the um, uh, bodies of the palm and the uh, trees uh, and the olive trees. This is how to uh, build the kerchief, and they uh, also use all the old techniques in the uh, restoration. And also now we are working to um, uh, rehabilitate the uh, area, uh, the entrance to, to the hotel to make it more, more welcoming to the tourism activities that we are expecting to coming to visit Siwa and Egypt. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Heidi. Again, abroad, uh, uh, Asoristaro have been working for several years uh, in uh, in Russia. First, with for the restoration of the St. Peter's Gate uh, uh, in St. Petersburg. It was 2005, and the first. Uh, international restoration that Asorestaro have performed together with the Italian trade agency. Then in, uh, in Moscow with the School of Restoration 2012 and uh, in Dagestan 2015 for a visit with the Ministry of uh, Culture. Armenia, Uzbekistan, uh, North Azerbaijan have been hosted in the restoration week for several years. This time we are hosting in some way Tajikistan. Uh, Andrea Dall'Oglio is not from Tajikistan, but he is a, a representative of the World Bank, one of the organization hosted this year in the restoration week, but he is strictly been as an example of regeneration in Tajikistan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrea. Thank you very much to Rich and Klaus for inviting us. And as Andrea was mentioning, I will be representing the World Bank, but uh, in reality, I'm also representing uh, the counterparts for, uh, from Tajikistan that wanted to be here, but unfortunately, due to the restriction. Uh, so what I will be doing uh, uh, in this presentation is to give you a sense of, uh, uh, of an example of uh, an investment that the World Bank is financing, is an investment in uh, cultural assets, but for the development of tourism, specifically in Tajikistan. So uh, let me give you, first of all, like maybe like a little flavor, uh, flavor of the country for those uh, who are not familiar with Tajikistan. So it's a country is located in Central Asia, is at the border with Afghanistan, is along the, uh, the former Silk Road. Um, and Tajikistan shares with Afghanistan like a, a border which is uh, 1,400 kilometers long. It's mostly an agricultural economy. Uh, and is characterized by a uh, high unemployment rate, and that's why one of the uh, key objectives uh, of the project is really like job creation. And specifically, we are focusing on two areas of Tajikistan that are the one uh, on the east, it's called the Gorno Badakhshan Autonomous Oblast, and, and, uh, and then the Catalan region, which is the uh, region south-west uh, uh, of Tajikistan. I will tell you a little bit more uh, about the two regions uh, afterward, but just to one flavor is that uh, the Gorno Badakhshan Autonomous Oblast hosts the Pamir Mountains that are called the, the um, roof of the world. It's basically the beginning of the 
Himalaya, uh, Himalaya um, mountains. Now, uh, when we look at uh, uh, the, this project and when we pre prepare this project, basically we see that the cultural heritage uh, rehabilitation is part of a broader set of intervention. We are basically uh, financing three uh, integrated uh, interventions. One is an investment in public infrastructure, which is the part, part of which is exactly the cultural heritage sites. But then we have an intervention to support the private sector. Imagine the tour operators, the uh, private sector operating in the, in the hospitality sector, uh, artists, craftsmen. So the private sector side of the, of the supply uh, of tourism. And then all of this uh, is blended together uh, with an activity uh, for country promotion and capacity building for private and public stakeholders. Now, I was telling you, I wanted to give you a flavor of the two regions. Well, they are very diverse uh, between one another, starting from the altitude, because again, one region, Catalan, is about on average 1,000 meters on the sea level, the other region, is reaches up to uh, 25,000 feet, close to 8,000 uh, meters. Uh, one region is very fertile, uh, very agricultural uh, prone. The other region is clearly being high mountains, uh, is uh, more difficult to uh, develop agriculture there. In terms of also population are very different because one region hosts more than 3 million people, the other, although it's actually bigger in size, host about 250,000 people. And also in terms of tourism, they are very different because one, the, because uh, the few tourists that are, uh, they, they were already coming to Tajikistan, were mostly visiting the mountains, the Pamir Highway, uh, and tourism is to be developed in the Catalan region. Although the Catalan region itself is still very much rich in culture, as some of the colleagues here uh, can testify. Now, looking at the, uh, at the cultural heritage aspects, uh, I wanted to give you a flavor of what we were trying to support. Basically, the first type of intervention is what we call the iconic uh, uh, like an iconic monument, the creation of an iconic monument for the country. What we notice is that, yes, people visit Tajikistan because of the beauty of the nature, because of the mountains, but what Tajikistan is missing is something like the Machu Picchu for uh, Peru or the uh, Eiffel Tower for, uh, for France, something that people would remember. So this castle in the, uh, uh, in the Wakan Corridor facing the Indukush, a, ca a castle that was uh, started probably like uh, the, in the third uh, century BC and was uh, further uh, added in the 11th century BC. Clearly, it has the potential to become the iconic site for, uh, for the country. And you know, and uh, this picture uh, really de described it in all the, the beauty because what you see in front of you is, is not anymore, it's Tajikistan is the castle, to view is already Afghanistan. And these mountains, these peaks reach six to 7,000 meters. But also tell you a little bit about the difficulties of renovating such an asset because it's very remote. You know, reaching uh, uh, the Yanchun Fortress from the capital is easily something that is in the good season, can take you 25 to 30 hours by car. And uh, also the complexity of uh, uh, undertaking a renovation of, of such kind. And what we, we, underst we, we have put uh, as, as an initial budget for the uh, rehabilitation is four and a half, five million dollars as part of this project that we know that will be only a, a stage one, where we want to rehabilitate uh, the, the fortress because uh, a part of it is rock, part of it is mud bricks, so it's also subject to the weather deterioration. Now, for the other region on the opposite, and this, this is, is located in the, in the uh, Gorno Badakhshan Oblast. Uh, of course, you know, the idea is uh, that uh, the, the Yanchun Fortress will become part of, uh, um, of an itinerary that already includes a number of other assets. Like we, we listed here the, these hot springs that are really like two kilometers from the, from the castle. We have shown you there a picture of the, of the Pamir Highway which is a pretty 
you know, iconic itself because you see this kind of high altitude uh, desert like uh, highway, probably one of the highest in the world together with the Karakorum uh, Highway in Pakistan. And then the city of Korog, which is the urban center that um, the biggest urban center in the area. Now, for the other, for the other region, for the Catalan region, we have selected on the opposite three sites. Three sites that are uh, also in terms of intervention are different from the from the fortress because they some of them have already rehabilit been rehabilitated, uh, and that one is, for example, the Oja Masad um, Madrasa. It's a madrasa from the 11th century that is being rehabilitated with the support uh, from the uh, American Ambassadors Fund. Uh, we have the uh, Chilchor Chasmau, which has a, a high significance uh, for the uh, Islamic world, and the Olbok uh, Castle, which is a, a citadel, a medieval citadel that was at the entrance of the Pamir Highway. For these sites, they are like there's in a medium say, conditions, but what they need is really like some kind of beautification. A large extent of the work that is required for these sites is what we would call landscape architecture and uh, facilitation of the uh, of the fruition of the site. Now, these of course are the intervention that on the on the cultural heritage. But as I was saying, they uh, need to be com complemented with uh, additional interventions uh, to foster the development of tourists. In terms of public infrastructure. Together with the with the investment on these four sites, we are, we have put together like a, a like a fund for funding community grants. Community grants that they would have to support both uh, uh, tangible but also intangible culture. For example, there will be these community grants for the organization of cultural events for or festival because this is something that you know the tourists would like to uh, to enjoy as well. But also the natural trails. Because the, the country has a has a reach of uh, natural uh, assets, but uh, the trails are not marked, uh, they are not identified, and also there are a number of other small assets like museum, other small cultural places that are also not necessarily extremely old. There could be like uh, also coming uh, going back to the to the Soviet times that they deserve uh, a smaller uh, like uh, rehabilitation. Then. An additional set of intervention is the one on the uh, on the private sector side. So we have set aside three million dollars in what we call matching grant. So basically, these are matching grants are basically uh, partial grants for the private sector. And uh, we, here we listed three type of private sector operator that we would like to target with our intervention. The first one is home stays, because. Uh, what we want to develop is some kind of community-based tourism that also creates uh, jobs and opportunities for the local population. And yes, there are some initial stages of agritourism and community-based tourism, but the infrastructure is very, very poor. And uh, the people, especially in the rural area, don't have the resources to fully finance this type of intervention. So what we are trying to, to do is to give them like a, a, a public contribution for these improvements. Of course, then there are improvements on the restaurant, on the hospitality sector, and the craftsman side. All of this is pretty much connected also with cultural heritage, because I was discussing with some of you during the week, uh, when we talk about homestays, what we would like to see is a rehabilitation like the one that we see here in Santo Stefano, where you take an old building and uh, you rehabilitate it rather than starting a new and uh, rebuild uh, something like uh, that could be lacking an identity. Uh, and then finally, what to all of these, this type of uh, art infrastructure investment, we are trying to uh, blend them together with uh, country promotion, because you imagine all of you come from countries we have just heard about Egypt or, or even Albania that are on the radar screen of tourists. Unfortunately, Tajikistan is not. So the country promotion itself uh, is extremely important. I mean, right, we, for example, through the project, we have supported now the publication of an international tourist guide dedicated to Tajikistan. We have also done ourselves a few uh, exercises of creation of some uh, promotional material that we have listed there, like one of them we called it like the 10 treasure of Tajikistan, that it unfortunately was missing uh, in the uh, in the in the printing um, world. 
uh, then what we uh, also do is the capacity building. We say we're in capacity building both with uh, the public institutions, both at the central level and uh, and uh, at the uh, at the local level, but also with the private sector stakeholders. You know, training of tour operator, training of uh, homestays and restaurants, training of museum. And of course, what we also would like to do is to see some kind of learning uh, from experiences. Even before we were invited to this event, we have initiated uh, like some collaboration, for example, with the provi province of Trento in Italy, because it shares very much uh, uh, like the similar landscape, similar history also, like in terms of like being an underdeveloped region. And now thanks to tourism is one of the richest uh, region in the country. We unfortunately with uh, this type of collaboration has not uh, Full materialized yet because of the uh, of the pandemic and the and the restriction, but we are looking forward uh, to continue. So I hope I gave you a little bit of a flavor, and I'm sure that if there are any questions, we can continue the discussion during the week. Thanks again. Thank you, Andrea. I hope we will meet soon in uh, Tajikistan, as I hope we will meet soon in Albania and uh, in uh, Egypt. We are a little bit late, but we are very close to the to the end. The Association for Preservation Technology is, is one of the most important international partners of Asso Restauro. When we talk about uh, the United States, uh, it is not immediate to make a relation, a mental relation with the, with the sector of restoration. No countries has no history. USA has a huge, is a huge market for our restoration industry and the preservation in the USA is a very structured sector which is represented by the uh, Association for Preservation Technologies. Finally, Asso Restauro have been uh, charged by the uh, APT International in 2019 to found the uh, APT Europe. We have uh, launched the foundation of uh, the APT Europe, the European chapter of the APT International, on the opening ceremony of the Restoration Week 2019. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the COVID restrictions have stopped for a while the development of the European organization, but we are very close to our objectives and we are planning to organize uh, the first annual conference uh, in Europe, of course, uh, very soon. We will let you know uh, shortly the, the, the programs. Jeff Green is today with us in representation of the APT uh, International. He is, uh, we can say, half Italian because he's living in Terracina. So, but please speak English. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Jeff. Well, thank you for, you want me to use the microphone? Thank you for. Uh, having me here and uh, thank you to all the other delegates for all of your presentations today. Really fascinating to see the breadth and, and spectrum of preservation across the world. It's uh, very encouraging. I have a little bit different take. I'm here representing the uh, Association for Preservation Technology. I'm on their board. Um, we have about 2,000 members right now in about 40 countries. Uh, as as uh, Andrea said, we've, there's a European chapter which is starting. Uh, it's a very active organization. We're really about the bricks and mortar, and I'm going to speak today about regeneration and adaptive reuse for my company, which is Evergreen Architectural Arts, and we're bricks and mortar guys. We, we do the forensic work. We look at the materials, what are things made out of, and, and solve the practical problems. So it's not about policy, although I have to acknowledge that the impact of preservation on creating social change and economic uh, possibility is enormous, but it wouldn't exist without the people who have the know-how to accomplish uh, the restorations. So I'll, I'll have a little bit of an emphasis there. Maybe we can look at a few slides and I'll be brief since it's late. Um, do we have a, do we have a program of slides? Otherwise I can tap dance. I mean, it's fine. <laughs> um, adaptive reuse. Um, so I just want to speak about a few projects again, uh, as Andre said, Every place has something that's unique about it, whether it's material culture or intangible culture. When I, the United States is a relatively young place. We're only a 
a little bit more than 200 years old, uh, heading towards 250. But every single place I go, whether it's in Iowa or Nebraska or Idaho, there's always some unique character, some reason why that place is there in its history and what it and, and what's uh, the the personality of the place now, uh, whether it's vernacular or high. But the examples I'm going to show are relatively new ones. Can we go to the next slide? So no, you went too fast. Go back one. Can you go back one? There we Backwards, not forwards. One more. There we go. So this is an interesting project. Um, uh, and I thought it was appropriate here for the... Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, to represent another uh, adaptive reuse into a, a luxury hotel. So this is the um, Five Beekman. It's right behind City Hall in New York City, uh, built in 1889. Uh, there's an interior atrium, which I'll show you pictures of. And uh, how the project was funded is they sold the air rights, uh, which is something we do in urban centers, and built a 51-story building next door, uh, which shared open space between this. Uh, the building was essentially abandoned after uh, in, in the 1940s and 1950s. So the, the occupancy rate of this building was about 10%. Uh, so essentially at a completely unused building in the middle of downtown in the financial district, which is sort of unheard of. And the reason was because of this atrium, right there's there's a picture before uh which didn't meet fire code so it, it would act as a chimney if there was a fire and there was no w way it was built before the fire codes so the innovation here was to as i said we were called in we spent about three years on this project doing the forensic work finding out what what the original colors were finding out what the original materials were and coming up with some innovative ways to uh adapt the building to meet the fire code so it could be translated into a luxury hotel uh, here's a few more. There's the atrium going up to the top, and um, and then here. Well, I'll go back one here. So this is beforehand, and what we were able to do is to create uh, uh, intumescent paint. I don't know if anyone's familiar with what this is. Uh, it's a paint that, um, when a fire comes, it expands, and so it stops the flames. So all of this metal work. Uh, had to be raided for fire and painted with intumescent paint without destroying the character of the of the, of the building. And in addition to that, they they uh, came up with a system of glass partitions which would drop in the case of a fire and protect the residents of, of, the, of the of the hotel so they could get out. And uh, so here's afterwards, we had to go back and find, uh, make original tiles, cast new cast iron pieces out of, out of resin, uh, repair all the plaster, uh, the wood, the woodwork. Um, it's a complete renovation of all the, all the materials. And now it's a, a successful uh, high luxury hotel with a wonderful restaurant. Of course, no one's going there now because of COVID, but I'm sure it will uh, come out on the other side. Uh, this is another adaptive reuse. This is the Union Terminal, uh, one of the last great train stations built in Cincinnati, Ohio, 1936. Uh, these are mosaics by Winald Reese, um, and it's been converted into a history and science museum. And we've seen uh, a number of, we, we've worked on about a dozen uh, train stations all across the United States, and its train travel has diminished. And as I said, this was the last one uh, they sent to the soldiers after World War II uh, from this station, and there were no other great stations built after this one. Um, and But in, in terms of transportation, we also removed several of these very large mosaics and brought them to the Cincinnati airport. Uh, uh, so we, you know, Took them out and transported them, and we restored all of the. Where did it disappear to? There we go. And then the on the right there is one of the murals that by a French artist named Pierre Bordelais, um, all done in linoleum, very unusual materials. So we have to research these materials and again do the forensic work, look at them under the microscope, see what they're made out of, and uh, restore them so that the building could be used. And another type of building that uh, my company works on quite a bit is uh, theaters and the reuse of theaters. Um, this is King's Theater. It's one of the five wonder theaters in New York. Uh, almost 4,500 seats originally. 
abandoned in the 1970s, completely uh, dilapidated. Uh, let's there we go. Um, and and the, many proposals. They wanted to make a church out of it. They wanted to make a, a, a fighting ring out of it. And finally, it was converted to a performing arts center. And and when we work on theaters, they're oftentimes the largest secular gathering places in any community. So they have an enormous economic impact and social impact because they revitalize all of the neighborhood around them with with uh, support materials. And uh, so. There's a before and after. I'm going to go quick here, not get into too many details. Here's a bank building that's being ad that was adapted for the Apple store uh, in on the Upper East Side. Again, an abandoned bank. You can see the graffiti and the holes in the plaster. And there it is, finished, all with Venetian Italian plaster, which we get from uh, Florence. I've been actually, I don't know if you know this, I've been importing a Colorificio Brandini. Uh, uh, Venetian plaster since the 80s to New York. <laughs> so uh, there is an, an, an Italian American connection. Um, let's see. So that, and, and we're working on one other Apple store right now, which is the Tower Theater in Los Angeles, which is being converted into another Apple store. So they have a very different aesthetic, this very clean aesthetic in historic spaces, but they recognize the importance of a uh, sense of place. For their products, so there, there, there's. It's odd that the you know this very modern Apple products are being. There's an affinity with them in historic properties. They've recognized the value of historic properties. Um, this is a project which we're about to get started on. It's another bank lobby in Oklahoma City. I've been chasing this project for about 25 years. I saw it 25 years ago. It was built during the uh, oil boom in the in the late 20s in Oklahoma and uh, used up until about the time of the Second World War and then declined rather precipitously through the 60s and 70s. And I first saw it in the 80s and the building again was about 10% occupied you know it's a it's a tower art deco tower let's see here and it's going to be converted again to uh, a luxury hotel and then this will be a ballroom space of uh, 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 where they can have catered events and it'll it, it's i think it's a very good reuse of the building but as i said it's been 20 years in the making so um those are just a few examples of the projects that we get involved with and uh, very different than the other examples we've seen so far. But I think there's a commonality in, and it interests me very much that everyone has spoken about the, the economic and social impact of preservation, but you need the craftsmen, and which, we, which you have in Italy because of the incredible artistic patrimony here. Uh, but in the United States, uh, my career is about 45 years. I've seen a, a, a diminution, a, you know, decrease in the number of people who know how to do the, these historic crafts. So it's also preserving the hand skills, the crafts, knowing, knowing the knowledge and knowing how to do this, not just policy, not just the economic impact, but also how to work with the materials and the tools. So I thank you. And that's what I have to say. Uh, thank you thank you very much jeff uh, we have had the opportunity to to analyze and to to watch a different models different approaches and very different re the results every country has a peculiar approach to the restoration but we have something in common and that something is passion we are all moved by passion so and this passion i think will uh, will move us together in more deep cooperation. We are very close to the end of these days uh, with uh, just uh, some greeting from uh, one of uh, our main media partner, which is Tile. We have here with us uh, a friend, Salvatore Ranucci, the editor of uh, Stile. Uh, Astorestaro and Stile are programming the presentation of the restoration so sector after the report of uh, Simbola, which will be anticipated uh, uh, on the 25th. So, Salvatore. Hello, good morning. Our group and uh, our guests from uh, abroad. Beh, allora, il progetto era, era un po' diverso, era quello di portarvi 
eh, in piazza San Lorenzo. No, no, eh, no, 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 e, e è un luogo, un luogo simbolo della città, eh, io lo trovo qui in questo momento e avrei avuto la scenografia del Papa Fale e tra l'altro è un luogo, un luogo e un sito di, di, di vostro interesse che sarà coccolato dalla vostra storia sul palazzo attuale, è molto simpatica, ha ospitato il primo conclave nel 1200 cardinali si riuniscono per eh, eleggere il nuovo Papa. Impiegano mille secondi, di quasi tre anni, e, non riescono a scegliere. I viterbesi dicono che eh, trovano più di bene nella vita, per cui eh, stanno in realtà perché i 17 cardinali erano divisi in due fazioni che ovviamente non trovavano mai equilibrio. Morale della faction, they could not make up their minds. Per indurre, per accelerare i tempi, li chiudono nel nella sala. Some point were actually closed. Causi con clave, a chiave, riducono i viveri scoperti. In rigore. And they were told that they had to decide to define the name of the new. Thank you for being invited. Thank you for having me invited. So, I'd like to thank you very much for having invited me. In cosa? In un reportage, in una monografia che uscirà a partire dal so, 7 di dicembre del 2020, eh, uh, parlerà uh, di, uh, di restauro. An article uh, that will be published soon, dire, soon and that will be focused on the topic that you are dealing with. Uh, uh, I've been dealing in this uh, uh, restoration, there will be many works of art shown in the uh, uh, magazine. Uh, Which undoubtedly is so rich in very interesting material. Queste forme di pietra sono così apparentemente sfuggite, in realtà sono effettivamente sostanzialmente eterne ed oggettive. E sono la vostra opera per essere interessata e aspettano il pubblico per essere visitate e per tornare protagoniste. Eh, allora, lo scopo del progetto editoriale di questa pubblicazione è quello di fare relazione, fare network. Di questo vi vorrei parlare. Il progetto è decisamente diverso da quello dei miei una normale pubblicazione in realtà è un progetto molto particolare uno per me è una modalità di particolare ma prevalentemente diffuso coinvolge in realtà che vengono in qualche modo identificati quindi mi piacerebbe che chi sta nel mondo del Stato partecipasse a questo progetto proprio per allargare il mondo di professioni committenti e appunto potrebbero essere possibili. L'altro aspetto fondamentale forse è quello che mi in questo momento mi così mi sollecita maggiormente quello legato alla comunicazione. Allora usciamo da un momento molto particolare, mi riferisco ovviamente a Covid, è stata una very difficult moment in time which was marked by COVID, this difficulty, but not very important, also took away the presence in terms of communication, problems also in terms of communication, 
eh, stanno con me in mezzo agli imprenditori e non poter so, parlare uh, eh, per noi è stata una mutilazione uh, mediatica molto uh, 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 però è successo un qualcosa è successo che nel, uh, appena usciti dal covid uh, abbiamo rincontrato i uh, e abbiamo trovati più forti che mai sono loro che ci hanno dato la hanno even stronger than before the period of COVID. Yes, there is a problem with the connection, unfortunately. So we are working in the field of economics. And of course, talking about restoration in the field of economy but of uh, of culture but economy is our main target so thank you very much to all of you for having been with us today we are late half an hour late so we have to skip the quest the q a session uh, we have recorded uh, all your questions uh, and uh, our board of directors uh, is working hard to give you answers and to send your questions to the speakers and to our guests follow us on on the chat and we will meet we will meet lately on the zoom meeting for the italian companies and the foreign experts which are interested in talking with them sonia will tell you more about uh, that so many thanks uh, to our board of directors. Can we see them on our screen? Just to say thank you very much for your efforts and to our guests, which are in this wonderful and amazing uh, place. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow at three o'clock, we hope this time, from Palazzo Rivaldi in uh, Rome. And uh, Thank you very much. Bye bye. Good evening. Thank you for your time and attention. It was a pleasure to have you. In a few minutes, we will start with the, the thematic uh, roundtables where you have the opportunity to meet uh, the Italian excellence of the sector. Uh, click in the Zoom link here below to enter in the meetings. Now, let's have a little break and see you in a few minutes. We remind you that this meeting is uh, open just for the registered user. See you there. Click in the link down here below.